dark side. Two, one, zero. Good afternoon. Hello. 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 Good afternoon. Hello. Hello. What back? Hello. 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 Uh, my channel is mainly 8-bit and 16-bit uh, games. I've got a variety of videos including Archie Perfect My Arse and The Friday Awful. Um, I'd first like to introduce my co-presenter, Mr. Chris Nova Weatherly. Yeah. Hello. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 Very nice. Yeah. I don't deserve that. I really don't. Uh, yes, I'm Nova Bug. Um, real name, Chris. Uh, I focus on Amstrad on my channel, which not many people do, but Ooh. I do. Someone's got it. Right. I did it. So, I'm going to move on straight to our guest, because it's not about really me, it's not about Alan, it's really about the guests. And uh, we have Andrew Hewson, we have Chris Bateman, and we have Rob Hewson. So, let's give it up. And you guys can just uh, introduce yourself and tell the crowd what you are known for. <laughs> I'm Andrew Hewson. What am I known for? Uh, well, I'm Rob Hewson's father. There you are. He's probably the most, uh, the, the most famous uh, thing. No, I, I um, uh, ran a publishing company, uh, as you probably know, in 8-bit and 16-bit software for a long time. Starting in 1980, when I first bought uh, a ZX80, uh, Sinclair ZX80 and wrote a little book, book about it called Hits and Tips for the ZX80. And if anyone's got a copy, I'd really like to have a look at it because I haven't got any left. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm Assisson. Is that one? Yeah. Yes. Uh, I'm Rob Hewson. I'm uh, Andrew Hewson's son, that's, uh, I suppose. Um, I, my career started really when I was. Um, working on the World Snooker Championship Series at a company called Blade Attractive, and then I did um, Hydrophobia, which was a game with water physics in it, and then I was um, game director at TT Games, working on a bunch of Lego games, so I was, um, how do you say, Lord of the Rings, Lego Lord of the Rings, Hobbit, Star Wars, those kinds of things. Um, and then uh, started up uh, Huey Games in 2016, um, and since then we've done uh, Hyper Sentinel, which was um, uh, heavily inspired by Iridium, which was a, a Houston game back in 1986, and some of the other classics, Defender and those kind of things. Um, and um, we are developing and publishing games, including uh, one of Chris's games, uh, which is Silk, which came out yesterday on Steam and Nintendo Switch, so shameless plug there for Silk, but uh, I'll let Chris uh, tell you more about that. Uh, and I'm Chris Bateman. Uh, I'm the uh, third wheel on this panel, uh, since I'm not a Houston. Uh, although I did play Houston Consultants games. In fact, the very first game I bought with my own money uh, was Paradroid. And I, I, I took an hour-long uh, bus journey to, to buy Paradroid for £10, which felt like a lot of money. Uh, I am a game designer, a narrative designer. Um, I had my 50th published game. I can't remember if it was late last year or early this year, but it all rushes by. Um, <laughs> my most successful game uh, uh, two million units is uh, Bratz Rock Angels, which I'm sure everyone in the room played. Uh, but I'm still best known for uh, Discworld Noir, uh, which was my first game as a lead uh, writer and designer, and Ghostmaster, uh, which is uh, perhaps the design I I'm most <coughs> proud of, uh, which is this wonderful haunting uh, simulator. And uh, the, uh, the other connection I have uh, to Houston, the legitimate connection is the one that was foreshadowed uh, by Rob, uh, which is that Huey is publishing uh, my game Silk, uh, which is a tribute to the late Mike Singleton's Lords of Midnight. I have spent most of my career trying to find an excuse to make a tribute to Lords of Midnight, uh, and I finally, uh, finally found a way to do it. So if you are a fan of Mike Singleton's work, then I thoroughly encourage you to check out Silk, which launched yesterday. <coughs> Chris, can I ask you what way? platforms that went up? Uh, this tape here is actually a, uh, it's a Kickstarter reward. It's um, can you, uh, yeah. my lovely assistant Rob will uh, demonstrate. <laughs> I might have broken it. Wasn't no, it, it probably got broken. I mean, um, it broken so it, it's a USB uh, cassette. Uh, you've probably seen these 
So it's in the style of, of, of a, a retro cassette, but it's actually USB. Um, they're mainly intended as Kickstarter rewards, but uh, we will have a few extra uh, for sale when we actually make them, uh, which unfortunately the launch of the, the game was held up production of them, but uh, it will be possible to buy uh, the game on a, a retro USB cassette, uh, should you be a collector with shelves to fill with cassette-shaped objects. <laughs> Thank you well. <laughs> that's, that's really cool. That's, that's... <laughs> Andrew, I'd like to start off with yourself. Um, obviously, how did you, could you just tell us a wee bit about how you first got into the business of selling and making computer games, which, let's be honest, was a niche hobby enjoyed mainly by school kids and grown men with iron jumpers and corduroy trousers? <laughs> well, I'm wearing jeans. I'm wearing jeans. <laughs> how did I first get into it? Well, I wrote a book around the ZX80 and, uh, because I wanted to make some money. Uh, I, was, um, I was working in the scientific civil service at the time. Uh, and uh, I, I discovered that, uh, and it, when you're a scientist, when you're a scientist, you're supposed to do research, publish paper, publish papers. And I came to publish my first, write my first uh, paper on my own, and found how useless I was at writing, uh, which was a bit of a shock. You know, this is 24, 25 years of age, something like that. A bit of a shock, so I, I had this idea, well, I'm going to write a book. Uh, because if I can succeed in writing a book, then writing is not going to be an issue anymore. Uh, and so when uh, Clive Seeker came out with the ZX80, then I looked at the machine and thought, I'm having a computer, I've been working on them for a few years, uh, the, um, I'm having one home, my home, one of my own, I'm, by, I'm using my own money uh, to pay for it, and I'm going to earn some money from it. And that was my target, was to earn some money. So I wrote this uh, book, and all I did was set the thing up uh, with the screen uh, and the cassette player, fiddled around with it <laughs> on the Zenitated keyboard, uh, and every time I discovered something about how the thing was working, then I wrote it down on, on, on my notebook, and that notebook uh, you know, formed itself almost automatically into um, uh, a book which I published myself, advertised in Practical Computing. Anyone remember that? And personal propelled computer work, I see it kind of thing. Uh, we all remember PCW, that lasted much longer. But yes, so uh, advertise that, and it grew from there. The book about the ZX81 uh, came along, uh, WX Smith uh, stopped that unbelievable, unbelievable book, which I printed uh, in my local, local photocopy shop, and sadly stitched, you know, he sadly stitched it. Uh, to, um, uh, make a little book, uh, and there's W. H. Smith uh, selling it. Extraordinary thing to uh, for, for that to happen, just mind blowing. Um, and uh, as a result of that, I got this column in Sinclair User, and that's really, in terms of profile, was the the, the key break breakthrough. I was in, in uh, you know, we we lived in Oxfordshire. I still live in Oxfordshire. Uh, and it was a phone call come through one day from London, you know, hello, I'm speaking from London. Mm -hmm. uh, we're, we're setting up this magazine called Sinclair User, will you write a, a, a con for us every month? Which led to the Houston Helpline. Anybody remember that in Sinclair User? No, you remember that. The, um, it's the boring technical stuff, which is what I was interested in. Um, and, of course, uh, as a result of that, uh, we got we had a profile. We were selling books. We were selling, selling memories for memory, adult memory for the ZX81, things like that. We started getting games coming in from people who were looking for games and thinking, mm, "There we are," and we became publishers, and it all flowed from there. Can I ask you who did the, the word consult also? The word consultants. Uh, I asked him this on the train. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah, sorry about that, uh, folks. It did give us a unique name, if a weird one. Um, it, it just came because I was working in the scientific ser civil service. I'm a qualified statistician. I'm sorry, I'm really boring. Uh, but I am, and I did some consultancy work, and that was the name. I, and I had a bank account in the name of some consultants. So that, that was, it, it all flowed from there. You know? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, but, um it must have been interesting for you growing up, uh, not only having a dad into video games, while you were at school, but also owning his own publishing house and producing the own games. Now, how was that at school? Did you? 
those experiences there? Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, I mean, it was um, uh, interesting. Uh, I think, I mean, I remember having a Commodore 64. I was born in 81, um, and having a Commodore 64, um, I wish I guess, turned up for, in about, when I was about three or four years old, or five maybe, and playing Gribbley's Day Out on that. And, um, and I remember that. Gribbley's Day Out. Who's played play Gribbley's Day Out? One of my favourites. Yeah. Oh, great. Uh, yeah. Brilliant. And, um, and then Iridium, of course. And I remember specifically, um, the, on the, I, I'm sure it was the Iridium title screen, Dad sort of looking over my shoulder and pointing at the letters H-E-W-S-O-N and teaching me how to spell my own surname. <laughs> and I remember running out into the sunshine with my friends and going, H-E-W-S-O-N, you know. <laughs> that's how I learned to spell. So that was um, interesting. And uh, yeah, I mean, at school, I do remember in primary school, there was a new kid, kid came to school, and one of the one of the girls said, uh, "This is this Rob. This is Rob. Rob's probably the most famous because his dad makes computer games in the school." <laughs> okay, um, and then I remember also, um, uh, you know, ever ever the entrepreneur, being about eight or nine years old, and deciding I was going to sell some of Dad's excess stock to my school friends. <laughs> And uh, his dad drove me around the village, and I, and I made posters, I drew the, this would have been around the time, this must have been the late 80s, early 90s, because the lizard logo, which came in in 1989, I was drawing the lizard, and I'd draw the lizard climbing up, you know, it wasn't, I would have fun with that logo, and pinning these posters, these homemade posters around the village, our village has got about 1,500 people in it where we grew up in Oxfordshire, pinning these posters up, but really just convincing a bunch of my school friends to come around to our house one day and we sold a bunch of that excess stock. And we made something like, I don't know, 150 pounds. I was like, oh, I've got 150 pounds, I can buy a Mega Drive or something like that. And then Dad soberly explained to me, well, actually, you haven't thought about your costs. You know? And like breaking down how much of it I actually got to, to keep after all that was cut. So that was my first business lesson, I think. So. Um, and, I, and I remember with my sister going and, and climbing among the cassettes Searching out for spoiled inlays that we could take home and stick up with blue tack. So yeah, it was, it was good times. So apart from uh, obviously you selling games in the playground, what was it? Who did you sell the other games in? Uh, Andrew, was it sort of like computer fairs or mail order stuff like that? Uh, yeah, uh, yes. In the early days, of course, there was no retail outlets at all. Uh, the ZX81, uh, once it, it was enormously popular. Enormous. You can't believe how. It, how popular ZX81 and ZX Spectrum were. Uh, but in the early days, there were no real retail outlets. This is 1981. They started coming on stream in 1982. Obviously, uh, W.O. Smith uh, came into the act. But originally, we were selling it mail order. And, mail order, and um, uh, that's good fun. I mean, it's great living at home, coming downstairs. Uh, there you are, there's the post lying on the doormat. It's at half past seven in the morning, there's a place. Uh, and there's a pile of letters in there, and you open the letter, and inside there's a cheque or a postal order, if anyone remembers what postal orders are. <laughs> postal orders, yeah. They, um, you know, from places like Sunderland. You know, places, places that nobody, nobody, well, certainly I've never been, probably not for many people who've been there. But, you know, places that you, you knew existed, but had only understood them being dots on the map, like Leeds and, you know, Carlisle, uh, Margate. Yep. Did you know anywhere north of Birmingham? <laughs> uh, I, I, did once get, uh, I did once get an order from a book through the post from a, a chap called Richard Baker. And I did wonder, I wonder if that's the guy who reads the news on the television. No, don't know the answer to that, man, by the way. But no, it's great. You come downstairs and uh, on, the, on, the, on the mat, there's envelopes and they've got money in them. And you think people are sending me money. People are sending me money. This is unbelievable. Uh, all from little ads, this big, in, um, in, in magazines. So, but that really was uh, rapidly replaced by a proper retail market. And, and it was during 82 and 83 that all those trading relationships really uh, came on stream. And so, I, actually, mail order sounds great fun, and it is, but it's a hell of a lot of work. You know, packing things up, casting them off to the post office, getting them posted. The, the, um, you really do think there's a more efficient way of doing, doing this, of course, there is. Uh, so, um, and those trading relationships really came into, into place over the phone, through, uh, in, in due course, through um, 
fairs, um, trading fairs, conventions. And the first of those was, of course, the ZX Micro Fair. Uh, anyone remember the ZX Micro Fairs? I'm sorry, you, you, this is yeah. really ancient history. Yeah, good. There are a few people who are almost as old as me. In the, room. Uh, the, the ZX Micro Fairs were wonderful sort of parties, really. The first one was at um, Alexander Palace in, in North London, and then at the Central Hall in Westminster. And this is another wonderful thing about those times. We'd have a, six, uh, a table, six foot, maybe you'd have two of them like this, put all your stuff out, out on there, stand behind the table, uh, and there'd be tables all around the room, people walk in, and the place was heaving, heaving, uh, with uh, people with money. Five pound notes, ten pound notes, twenty pound notes, fifty pound notes. I've never come across fifty pound notes. Uh, you know, like fifty pound notes. I've never seen one before. I've never seen one. There we are. People saying, "Yeah, I've got fifty pound note. What can you give me for fifty pound note?" So that's how keen people were to to just find out about uh, these these computers and how they worked and what they did. Uh, the excitement is just. Uh, uh, not something that really I've ever experienced in my lifetime, except around that period. Um, and of course, uh, being involved in, in that great fun, because at the end of the day, all you, you, you met all the other traders in the room and, that, uh, and, and formed a lot of relationships with people, who got to know people, uh, you know, and all having the same kind of um, uh, fun as you are, you are. And gradually the personnel changed and, and hurt. But 8283, uh, the, um, the official sort of operation started moving in, led by W.H. Smith. Uh, people were setting up retail shops <coughs> and what have you, people, distributors were uh, coming into being, and we started supplying in bulk. Uh, so instead of you know one set going out the door in uh, a jiffy bag, it would be a box of 500. Has anyone here picked up a box of 500 cassettes? See, I'm the only one who's done that. <laughs> they're very heavy, I tell you. I really, you know, they're poor. Uh, we, uh, we had, by this time, we had an office in Wallingford, uh, the local market town, over the print shop where I had, where I had the books printed. Uh, and this is in uh, the building, well, it probably isn't medieval, but I would think it's it, Tudor, somewhere like that, you know, that sort of time. Been around for a long time. So the floors were not altogether secure. So, and we were on uh, upstairs, uh, and so carrying those boxes up and down those stairs, boxes of 500 cassettes, and then storing them in there, and thinking, I hope the floor can take this weight. Because, you know, we had quite a lot of, um, uh, quite a lot of stock going there. Uh, in 1984, was it 1984? You, you always get the, the time right. February 1984, I think we moved to uh, a proper industrial unit, which is what you'll remember. Uh, uh, on uh, in a place called Milton Park, uh, where we had 2,000 square feet, which is about a, a bit bigger than this room. Uh, yeah, a bit bigger than this room, uh, probably twice the size. Um, uh, and that's where we had all our stock and the offices and all the rest of it. We could do the job properly because by this time we were beginning to motor. We were saying really substantial numbers of um, uh, lots of books. I wrote two books about books about the spectrum. Uh, one, one with John Hartman, uh, and uh, we were selling loads of cassettes. And uh, 1984, made some money, bought a uh, cassette duplicating plant, and that went into one corner with, um, uh, with um, a compressor outside, because uh, it was all driven by compressed, these were driven by compressed air, um, the, uh, the um, duplicating machines. So we had a big, tape recorder on a big stand like that and uh, and um, cassettes are duplicated by literally the um, uh, you have a reel of tape that way uh, and uh, for a kind of cassettes we were making which are really quite short compared to music cassettes you could get about 500 copies on that tape so we had a big reel to reel tape recorder to record over and over and over and over and over, and over again on this uh, Reel of tape, then the, um, uh, we had two of those, and the reel of tape then went to uh, the thing which wound the cassette, uh, the tape into the cassette, 
which is a wonderful piece of the Robinson machine. If you're interested in, in that kind of mechanical, electromechanical, air driven nonsense, uh, then it's a fantastic machine. Fantastic. The, the cassette shells sort of drop into a hopper, get snipped because they've just got a plastic piece of tape running between the two uh, spools, uh, uh, and then held, and then the tape set the tape on, and <laughs> The tape's wound in and then stopped at a marker in the tape, and then uh, another piece of cellar tape. It's all done you know, automatically, it's a fabulous machine, and, and, and then this thing spat out into, into a hopper. So, uh, and that was all driven by compressed air with compressor, compressor sitting outside. Uh, and of course, I, would, I had a grand office, well, I didn't, I had a little, you know, little pokey thing in the, in the corner. Uh, with, a, with a few other people with similar pokey little holes to work in. But when the compress went on, uh, you know, you'd hear these things thumping away outside. I think, great, making money. And, you know, when it went off again, mm, it would stop. Oh dear. How um, many units were you having to do an initial print run for a, a title at that point? That's, um, well, uh, I don't really remember the 20,000, I would think. I mean, I do remember. This is a lot one on the way, but in, in the same building, um, Pimble Dreams, when we re released up on the, on the um, Amiga, uh, which was um, uh, obviously on, um, disc, on a disc. Yeah. On a disc. Uh, the first run of that in, 20, in the old box did 25,000 units. So, uh, and that takes up a fair amount of space. You know. But, I mean, the numbers are portrait compared with uh, uh, what some of uh, these days, and that, that will be. Um, yeah, but the money's shared between many more people these days. You, you were uh, taking most of that yourself. Absolutely. Taking it home, sticking it in a box. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know, it's mine. Leave it alone. All, all alone. No. Uh, <laughs> the, um, uh, to, to be honest, the, the books are the things that really set the numbers. I mean, we get 100,000 units of books. Uh, I should have written more of them, shouldn't I? But yeah. well, I didn't. I was too busy, busy running the company. When you um, chose the games, I mean, I'm assuming that the yeah, code is sending the code to you, uh, you were filtering the games. Some of, the, some of your games are like quite landmark stuff, you know, kind of like it's, you know, unique to what it was doing at the time, and especially something like Nebulous, which showed that sort of scrolling trick, you know, it was cross-platform as well. Something that you can see on the Commodore, but maybe look at the Spectrum, look at the Amstrad do this. When you looked at the game, did you think that's going to sell, or did you think it had a life in it? What was the thinking behind it? Well, that? Yeah, that's very interesting. I've got technical background. I mean, you know, I, I came into the business as a scientist. I really moved on to the programming when I was doing my scientific work, which sounds grandiose, but it's true. Uh, who's written programs in Fortran 4? Yeah, good. good. I wrote for you. Huh? I wrote for you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah. <laughs> We did Slayer, Mercury, um, Ikari Warriors, and a few others on Commodore, Amiga, and Atari ST for you. There we are. Stand up and introduce yourself. Woo! I'm Neil Metcalf, used to be Microsoft Software. I remember playing Slayer, and I remember the, the big dragon, uh, do you know, you know what I mean? Obviously, yeah. you know, yeah. um, the big dragon that was on the cover, and drawing pictures of that dragon, so it was the coolest thing in the world. So, yeah. Great game. Well, thank you very much, yeah. How many chips? Well, there we are, we've an example. Um, I was very interested in, t in the technology and how it all worked. That's oh. what really turned me on. And I, I'm sorry to everybody here, but I'm not really a games player, that's my problem. I was always, always interested in the technology. Uh, and of course, it rapidly became clear that you could do what we did, certainly did in the early days, which is you could do knockoffs of other people's products. You, uh, therefore, the, the, you could very easily do things that were really similar. Pa panic, spectral panic, space invaders, that kind of thing. Yeah. But, uh, but, you know, that's not really interesting to the market. It's not really interesting to you yourself either. So, uh, and we just, we just looked, at, uh, looked for what was original and interesting uh, and, and turned us on. And so that's why we picked up the, the kind of people we did. I'm, I'm intrigued here because you, you say you're not much a player of the games, and yet the Houston catalogue was just full of these really amazing games. I mean, you really always mention 
Grimley's Day Out came up before, Paradroid in between it. I realise it's all Graph Gold games. So I, I forgot to mention, I do have a connection with Graph Gold, because I worked, on, I worked with Graph Gold on their last unpublished game before they closed the shop. Um, which never really gets discussed because nobody's ever heard of it. But uh, you, surely, surely, you had a, at least enough of experience with these games to tell that they were doing interesting things in the game. And that developed. I wouldn't say that I knew, I knew that immediately. Uh, the, um, I mean, Grippy's Day Out, for example, was such a different product. I mean, it's just wild. It's, 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 it, it's, dropped, it's dropped out of uh, Andrew Braybrook's head. It, you know, it's a complete dream that he, that he put down and, and programmed. Uh, and so, uh, I wouldn't say that when I looked at that in the first place that I understood what a great game was going to be. But it did actually learn fairly quickly that, it, that on the one hand you need the technology to get people looking at the thing in the first place. Um, to, because that, in the early days it was all about doing something new, mostly using something new visually, sometimes something new in the sound effects. But mostly doing something new visually, that's what, what, what was gripping. It was as though the world was moving forward in that direction. Just like this one, Nebulous, I mean, that's a great example. That rotation was uh, must have been a, a huge visual novelty at the time. Well, uh, well, yeah, that's 1987 we put that out. And, the, um, and I, I can actually remember going down to see John Phillips, who wrote it. Uh, John had done another game for us previously, and that's, uh, there's a long story about how that, that tower came into being. But when I went down to see him, he'd got this uh, column rotating uh, and um, he was thinking of a, a sort of battle game, a medieval battle game set. Uh, and uh, when I looked at it, I was very hung up on Euridium at the time because he'd obviously had a year, huge success with Euridium. And so I wanted to make it a simple game, you know, don't, don't make life more complicated. And that's an important lesson for all of us, to be honest, it applies to one of, uh, one of the games that Hydrophobia. That, uh, which uh, Andrew worked, worked on, they just made that far, far too complex for the, for the technology that they had. But here, uh, this, is a, this is a good example of, at that time, that rotation of that town was something which was impossible. Nobody had ever seen that before. Nobody had ever seen that. In fact, I've got a little story about Julian Rickman. Do you want to know the Julian Rickman story? Oh, yes, please. The, uh, Julian Rickman being... Um, uh, one of the journalists at uh, Zach 64, who by 1987 had a huge reputation uh, for um, just, uh, you know, he could make or break a game uh, easily. Uh, and uh, we were at an exhibition in Olympia uh, in September of 1987, it must be. And we had a stand there, and of course, uh, we, uh, John had put this together. The game wasn't finished, but uh, 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 Nebulous wasn't finished, but the, um, he put together a sufficient demo for us to show him. Uh, and I saw, uh, John, uh, I was standing off to one side, and I saw Julian Rignall coming across to our stand uh, through uh, Olympia, or off to one side. And he was coming to check out and see what we're up to, you, you know. At the, um, and he came to the stand, and we, uh, we got uh, um, Nebulous on show, but it was static, it didn't move. Uh, there was nothing moving on the screen. We hadn't had time to put in any kind of track mode. Uh, but fortunately, you know, there's a joystick there, and he picked up the joystick, and he must have jogged it as he picked it up. Uh, and um, as he jogged it, the tower moved around like that. And I saw him go like this. And I just thought, I've got it. You know, you're hooked. That's it. The, uh, you're, you're sold on something that you've never seen before. Because obviously, the game is actually. It's a platform game. How many platform games have been released by that time? By this is 1987. I mean, it's long after Jet Set Willy and things like that. Uh, the we don't feel the um, it's a platform game, but it's wrapped around the town, and of course it's got a huge write-up uh, from um, from Julian and others, and and what won a few awards and got converted on all sorts of other platforms, and went to the states, and was on uh, the Nintendo. The no. Were these trade shows the only places you had to, uh, to meet the journalists, or were you having to do some other uh, promotional activity with them? Went to go and see them quite a lot. I mean, uh, they uh, went to see Crash in um, uh, Anzac 64 in Ludlow. That's quite a trot. 
No, I've never been to the Dutch Low. I mean, why do they put it where it is? It's a long way from everywhere. So it's in, mid, you know, it's in, in mid Wales, sort of halfway down. And it's, it's where you go through on the way when you go to the coast, isn't it? So a lovely town. Uh, and uh, yeah, you used to go, go and see them. You used to go up to London to see um, uh, see BG and uh, see Play Use and whatnot. And uh, of course, Future set themselves up in Bath. Um, the uh, uh, Chris Anderson, Chris Anderson was originally was the launch editor on Zap 64, uh, and then he broke away from uh, with, uh, them and set up Future Publishing, which is still going uh, to this day. And he's made a lot of money, a lot of money uh, out of that. Um, and, uh, yeah. Does anyone know Chris Anderson? No, no, no. Is he the head or is he one of the head or He was the original editor of Zap 64. So what was your relationship with the magazines then, Andrew? Obviously you say these guys, it was pre-internet, whatever they said would basically make a break again. Yeah, it rapidly became obvious that they were the people who determined what people thought. And so you had to go and influence then. And so I've got a story about Iridium, uh, if you like. Um, Iridium uh, we published in 1986, it was the third of Andrew Braybrook's great games. Um, and um, uh, we'd, with Paradroid, we'd done a, 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 a programmer diary in Zap64, which I negotiated with Chris Anderson when I went to see him. We actually did that deal over a pint in the pub. Uh, and the, well, why not? Uh, and so we done, and um, uh, other magazines were quite jealous of this, in particular CMVG, like Computer and Video Games, who were the biggest uh, in terms of circulation, because of course they covered all the platforms rather than just Zap 64, just covered the 64. So, um, and the editor of, of um, CMVG was um, Chuck Gorton Metcalf, who lived uh, just outside Oxford. So not so, yeah, 20 miles from where I live now. Uh, and so when Iridium was at a certain stage and we, uh, I've got something we could show, we'd actually done, we'd, uh, we'd done the artwork for it as well. Uh, I you know, just arranged to go and see Tim Metcalf. He said, come see me at home. So I trotted up the road to, um, to see him. Showed him an early version of, uh, of um, the game. He was really switched on by it. And this is a good example of me not really understanding it. <laughs> what I got, you know, I'm saying, oh, good, I'm glad it's good. I mean, I, you know, I see technically what's going on here. I'm glad you're enjoying it, you know, but he played it, so oh, that's good, you know, um, that sort of endor endorsed the viewpoint that other, other people have been telling me. Um, uh, and there we are, there, there it is. Uh, and here's the artwork. And of course, the artwork at that time was quite, uh, quite, I mean, we spent a bit of money on it. It was, it was um, really nice artwork. And so we did the deal. Uh, we got the artwork on the front cover of CMVG reversed. Then, has anyone got that co copy of the PSP games? No, yeah. Look out for it on eBay or what have you. You'll see the artwork of Iridium is printed back to front. Uh, it's reversed this way. And that's because, so, because the ship is coming this way and they can write the words they want on the right hand side. I mean, from your point. The right hand side of the ship on the left. Does that make? Am I making sense? Yeah. They, so they want to put their run their words down the right hand side. So they reverse the artwork. So we got our artwork on the front cover of CMVG, and in return we put an ad in CMVG, and they put some um, two page spread uh, reviewing, and they got a bit of lead time on everybody else. They got about ten days, and that's really what they were after. You know, it was just getting this this game ahead ahead of other people and being able to get two fingers to Zap64 in their own way. That, that was my idea as far as it Now, that's the first and last time anyone's got their artwork printed on the front of a computer magazine. Nobody ever achieved it after that. Nobody done it before, nobody achieved it afterwards. The reason nobody ever achieved it afterwards was because the, the ad manager on the magazine was absolutely living. It was beyond living. He didn't know what, what the deal that the editor had done. Uh, you know, the editor, in principle, through its design, it controlled the front page, did the front cover artwork, the ad manager didn't. 
uh, the ad manager only discovered that this was going on after the magazine had gone to bed and been published. Uh, and, and but as far as he was concerned, he'd been selling 30, 40 pages of, uh, of adverts inside this magazine, and we got, uh, we sort of dominated them by putting our art, artwork on the front. And, and, it, and yes, you know, poor old Tim got a real bottle of that. Why does Uranium get so much more attention than Paratroid? I mean, Paratroid has the Bass Relief um, graphic effects earlier, got a higher review score uh, in, in Zap64. Uh, the cover illustration isn't quite as good, but, um, but, uh, but also more influential. I still suspect that Paratroid was an influence on um, DMA's design for the original Grand Theft Auto. I haven't proved it yet. Still trying to pull that one off. Better in the room can help me research that, and I would appreciate your assist. But Uridium gets way, way more attention. Why? It's so warm for a start. Uh, uh, Do you know the numbers for those two? Oh. Just uh, uh, order of magnitude. Uh, could be, did it, uh, no, I don't know. No, I never, I never tossed them up like that. You've got to remember that we re released and re released and repackaged them. Uh, and um, license. And you were doing your bookkeeping on paper at that point mostly, were you? No, no, no. No, no, no. no we are okay. You are okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's, we're bound to, I mean, we were one of, I tell you, I've got another story about that, I'll tell you that in a minute. Remind me to tell you about the bank manager. There you are. The, uh, the, uh, the, 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 Handling a great product by uh, by this time. Right. Uh, the um, I mean, around this period, we had Groupies, we had Paradrive, we had Avalon on the Spectrum. Uh, you know, we had, we had Night Flight, uh, Night Flight Two on the Spectrum. We had, uh, we had Heathrow Air Traffic Control, which was relatively easy to convert. We began to realise that we could convert these things. We never attempted to convert Paradrive. We should have done, uh, mainly because, uh, and of course, this this is to do with being stupid. Hands up all those people in the room are stupid. They, uh, they, I'm certainly stupid. I mean, but that's a good, not converting paradigm is an obvious stupidity, isn't it? I mean, but that opened the door to Quasitron, presumably, which you didn't publish? We did publish. Oh, you did uh, publish? Well, yeah, Quas yeah, Quasitron's on, on the spectrum. Um, yes, yeah, it, it, it sort of stood in for, for instead of porting uh, uh, Paradrive, we got Quasitron. Yes, sort of. Uh, I mean, obviously, Quasitron came from Steve. Steve Turner's writing the Spectrum products. This is in Graph Gold. Uh, and Andrew Bradford was writing the um, C64 products. Who knows that Andrew started off uh, his gaming life writing conversions to the Dragon 32. He did not really turn to the Dragon 32 that, that we published uh, for him. Anyway, do you want the bank manager score? Oh, I do want the bank manager score. Yeah. 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 Since you're teaching, uh, teaching me about bookkeeping, no, um, we, um, uh, I bought a copy of Sage uh, so accounting software in 1983. I can remember the shop that I bought it for, from in Banbury. Um, uh, and that, you know, which put us uh, way ahead of most of the world. You know, they're having um, this is experiencing the horror of computerized accounting. This is in CPM. So it's running on a, 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 a Z80 machine. Do you remember the CPM operating? Yeah. He yeah. thought you were coming here to hear about computer games, but it's accounting <laughs> software that's getting your mind on. Yeah, it's really good stuff. Uh, the, but more importantly, yeah. So we're running. We're running. We're one of the early adopters of, uh, of Sage. Uh, so that's what we did. But of course, by, in, in, by this time, you know, we're making quite a lot of money. So I've got another relationship with the bank manager. Uh, the um, and uh, we, on CPM there was a spreadsheet called SuperCal. So there we are, we all use Excel these days, but the precursor to, to Excel it was SuperCal on the CPM. So obviously I laid out everything on um, a nice spreadsheet, the way you would. Uh, went on to bank, bank manager, to, this is our plan, you know, slid the piece of paper across the table to him. He's got a nice big, you know the big black chairs that people have when they're important. Not the mastermind chair, not the mastermind chair. Yeah, a mastermind chair. He's got a big mastermind chair, he's only a little chap, so it's a big chair. Uh, and the desk is, you know, a grand desk, because this is a bank. And in those days, banks had to look, you know, really posh and grand and expensive and all the rest of it. So I slid the piece of paper across the desk room. Oh, I've got it there. 
Uh, and uh, it's got all the numbers on for you. And he picked it up like this. Picked it up like this. Is this a spreadsheet? <laughs> that was his question. Is, is, is this a spreadsheet? You've never come across one before. Never, ever. <laughs> For him, it was a novelty to, uh, to, to meet anyone who ever used a spreadsheet. <laughs> there you are. You never, you never thought you'd come along and learn that sort of thing. Should we go back to the video game? <laughs> well, <laughs> so, uh, what are your dad's games? What is one of your favourites? Um, Pinball Dreams. Uh, I certainly remember when the Amiga came home with Pinball Dreams on it for the first time. That was, this was a step up from the stuff we'd been playing um, on the C64 and what have you. And I remember um, spending the entire weekend trying to beat the score, the high score of Barry Simpson, who was the producer at 21st Century, um, you know, working for Dad. And yeah, spent the entire finally beat his high score. Me and my sister screaming, come running down, tell them and dad, because to us, you know, that's a huge obviously they'll be excited as well. And, uh, you know, <laughs> they weren't so excited. But I as a as a cocky, I don't know, eleven or twelve year old, I I got had a handwritten note which I gave to dad to give to Barry at work, mocking him for the fact that I beat this high score, which was a stupid thing to do as an 11 or 12 year old, because of course um, I bumped into, back, my, my mum and I bumped into Barry in Tesco's a couple of weeks later, and we had a nice conversation, you know, I didn't bring it up, didn't say anything, obviously. And then as we were walking away, he turned around and went, oh, rather than that, yeah, doubled your score, by the way. <laughs> so, just a lesson in humility there. But yeah, that was a fantastic game. Um, and then also the Pimble Fantasy, and went on to the build a complete pinball strategy from that. Can I ask you, what, what, what was it? Was it the clue? Uh, Steel Wheel. Uh, my my favourite is the Nightmare Table. The, the sound effects are fabulous on them uh, for Pimble Dreams. For those of you who haven't played it, you need to go and find it online. Uh, Nightmare Table is the best one. The sound effects are tremendous. Yeah, I've yes. played Pimble Dreams. Yeah, I see. A lot more people have played the Pimble games, I think, than a lot of the other ones. Certainly the Gribbleys, apparently. Yeah, they, who, who has played Gribbleys Day Out? Yes. You, you rule, all of you, every one of you. One thing that I think uh, for myself that's a part of Houston is you can name programmers Steve Turner, Lambert, Raybrook, Raphael, Seiko, probably more than any other. You think of Ocean, you think of maybe Joppa Smith, but after that I can't think of anybody else. These guys are always the big, big names and people knew when Andrew Braybrook brought out a game, people went and bought it because it was him. How did you actually get these guys on board? Was it because you knew them from previous? Or? It was deliberate. I mean, it, it was deliberate, absolutely. The, uh, uh, I wanted to, really. Uh, nobody else seemed to do it. I never really understood that. I never really understood that. One or two people did. Uh, Kevin Toms promoted himself for football manager. Uh, and Mike Singleton, uh, for example. There weren't one or two, but we, yeah. ju we, we just... Uh, obviously, these are the people who've done the work. Uh, and they're the people who've got the stories. They're the people who, who um, uh, know what they've done. So. We, we held uh, press launches uh, for a period of time. It was a very effective way. It was the, the first one we did what, for was for Avalon on, on the Spectrum. Uh, it was a very effective way of, uh, of generating coverage. And we uh, bring the programmes along, we introduce them, and they can talk about what they did. And of course, our programmes are nerdy. I'm nerdy. We're all, we're all nerdy. Andrew in our Braybrook own. would not have enjoyed being in the spotlight over what my experience is of it. No, Andrew, Andrew will be there, and Steve, Steve will do yeah, the talking. Steve is quite happy to do the talking we'll for, do for the, everyone. Right? We'll do the public yeah. thing. Steve will do the public speaking. Andrew will certainly talk one to one to people, no problem about that. But uh, yeah. a very good drinker as well. <laughs> <laughs> uh, good musician, in fact. That's yes, yes. Uh, the, um, uh, Yes, yeah, so we promoted them deliberately, and it's part of our strategy that to make to, to give a reason for being involved with the game uh, and some sense of contact with uh, with how the thing was was developed, uh, and uh, and we did it right the way through to the pinball products. We did the same with um, digital, uh, uh, what digital illusions, dice is their name. Dice is their name. 
They, uh, yeah, st I, I still think of them as digital illusions as well. Yeah, digital. But they're actually secretly. I, just I think dice right? Yeah, I think yeah. it's digital illusions, creative entertainment is where dice comes from. Yeah. But now it's again dice, obviously. Yeah. Uh, so it was del deliberate po policy. Uh, I saw it as being a very important way of uh, um, uh, promoting. In the extent, as I say, is it's like a, a band. If you like a band, you're going to go and buy their single. So if you know that a game is by Andrew Bailey, you're going to go and buy it. You know what you're getting. You know what's going to have a silly quality. EA copied the strategy several years afterwards. Very, very, very briefly, they had that famous um, ad in the magazine show off their uh, very ugly rock star programmers. Um, oh, who's the uh, Sims guy? I forgot his name. Um, oh, um, what's his name? Um, you know, what's his name? Sorry, yes. Somebody knows. They, 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 Will Wright. Will Wright. Will Wright, yes. Will Wright is front yeah. and centre in this picture of nerds that was a full page spread that he ate in. And I think they stole that strategy from you. Oh, it's a terrible thing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm curious, now we're talking name brand programmers. Do you know whether or not Steve Crow ever submitted anything for uh, consideration at Houston? Uh, he, he did use oh, it. Oh, he did use it. Oh, I with you, of course. Yes, yes, okay. He is still um, uh, working in the video games industry. He is actually at um, Blizzard. He is a programmer at Blizzard these days. I, I interviewed him um, for my blog uh, a while back. And he's very humble. Uh, a very humble little guy. Uh, I'm a big fan of uh, Steve Crow's yeah. work. Uh, the, um, the artwork we did for that, uh, Fire Lord, really nice. Uh, one, You've got the you've got the award. Have I? Yeah. <laughs> did I do the artwork? No. No, I had a drawer full of we had a drawer full of awards. I've just gone out to join all the other stuff things. But you've you've got it now. You? Oh great, okay. We got uh, uh, an award for the uh, best advertising or something like that, nineteen eighty six. Speaking of working with creative people, Chris, you work with Toby Patchett, is that correct? What was uh, tell us something about that you know, experience of working with uh, such a legendary writer? Yeah, it was, it was it was brilliant. But the thing is, I was only in my twenties, and I was just an arrogant little bastard, really. Uh, and I definitely didn't I definitely didn't treat Terry with the respect he wanted. But he was he was really an, a, an amazing person to work with, and really respectful for, uh, of his fans. And he had written um, he had written a letter to uh, J.R.R. Tolkien as a, as a kid, a fan letter, and he got a reply back. And it really stuck with him, and, and he, he made this sort of conscious decision when he was actually had fans coming together that he was going to be enormously respectful um, uh, of his fan base, which he always was. And um, I, I didn't deserve to work with uh, Terry, to be quite honest. And he was very, very patient with my uh, arrogance as a twenty-year-old who thought he knew everything. But it was it was a, one of the most joyous parts of my career. It was uh, I wrote the script for this one more. In, in a, a fevered month, uh, that I, I wrote like 14 hours a day, cranking out this, this script in order to have it ready for Terry before he went on holiday to Australia. He took his family away to Australia, so I needed to have this whole thing ready for him to edit. Um, and I should have been nervous about about this, but um, I didn't even register in my head uh, that, I, that, that I, who was an absolute nobody, was having this script edited by somebody who was already enormously popular and successful. And it's, he's still the best editor I've worked with. The, the, the edits the script, he only changed the things that needed changing. He made the smallest of changes to bring out the, the best of the situation. He let an astonishing number of my bad jokes remain because he had a real taste for uh, bad jokes. Uh, poons, he didn't like to talk about really, really bad puns. Um, and uh, yeah, I've never worked with an editor with, the, with this balance of a light touch but, but really willing to change anything that needed uh, to be changed. It was just it was a, a brilliant piece of work. And I, I vividly remember in the recording studio, because I got to work with a fantastic voice cast on this. Rob Brydon, who was a nobody at the time, but uh, who is he's big now. Um, oh, I'm so bad with names. One of the young ones, what's his name? Oh, David Edmondson. No, Rick, no. Yeah. Nigel, Nigel Plainer. Sorry? Nigel Plainer. Nigel Plainer. Nigel Plainer. Uh, Robert Llewellyn, who is Crichton. Uh, Robert Llewellyn was a joy in the recording studio. And uh, Kate Robbins, who had been a, a voice actress with Spitting Image, who was amazing. But in the studio, I was keeping score as to whose jokes got most laughs out of the voice talent, mine or, or Terry's. And uh, this was a sort of 
running game for me. And, and, and for me, the, the best moment was when one of my gags cracked up Robert Llewellyn so much that we had to take a 10 minute break uh, to continue it. And that, that just felt like an enormous victory for me. I think for why I, I was trying to compete with Terry Pratchett is a complete mystery. But like I say, I was in my 20s and I was just completely arrogant and out of my depth, but too naive to know that I was out of my depth, which, which really worked for me. But uh, he was an absolutely wonderful uh, person and a, a real joy uh, to work with. I, I, uh, I was very upset uh, the, the day that I, I heard him pass, uh, but he was he was incredible. He was a real, real gem of a writer and a, a real joy to work with. So it was a great time, and you got quite a laugh as well. So it's just <laughs> amazing. Sport mod, topless lady. Was that a little bit ploy to to go to the younger audience? That's an interesting one. I, I, was it a deliberate ploy? I didn't really know about it until after it happened, <laughs> you know, buried in the game. So, uh, it's one of those things, isn't it? Uh, I didn't like the artwork that we produced for Storm Wars, some, some, you know, the box art. They, they, uh, some people like it, some people don't. Uh, it didn't do anything for me. They're not a deliberate ploy, uh, but, um, yeah, it's there, sorry. <laughs> don't be. <laughs> <laughs> disappointing yeah, notes. No, 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 no. <laughs> so shall we open the floor up to questions? Yeah. Anyone have any questions for Andrew, Rob and Chris? We've got a chat over here. Oh, yeah. Do you still stick your tongue out when you're testing games? <laughs> he, he does when he's driving. <laughs> <laughs> I stick my tongue out all sorts of times. Not just testing games, yeah. It's interesting the story about uh, in some 20,000 copies of a game, I guess these days people you know, can so easily patch games online and they kind of release them half done, you know? Um, so when you're kind of about to put 20,000 copies of a game out, how much time do you spend kind of testing them and playtesting them and things like that? Well, I had a rule of thumb uh, when we were coming up to this is just a rule of thumb, uh, and it developed, uh, which with three months to go was where we would start. Uh, the PR for a product. Um, obviously, if you've got, you might have a long run, running story, but in principle, that's when it kicked off. That we would be in, uh, working with the programmers to know when they thought they were likely to finish, and always, we're, always, of course, we're screaming for it, and always they're saying, "Give us more time." You know, there's that, always that battle going on. But with three months to go, we'd we'd start working out. Uh, producing the box art because you would see enough of the game to be able to look at the box to, to work out some kind of box art. What, uh, and then you're developing the stories about what's important about this game, game and what the, the USPs are and what the things you're trying, going to try and promote and what the screenshots going to be for the packaging and that kind of thing. So, um, uh, and then with one month to go, we want uh, finished product. Finished in the sense of, yeah, uh, we're now able to get into the play, play testing cycle. And then, so that final month is just play testing. One month of for quality assurance. <laughs> why, why are people laughing? Oh, it's, uh, well, it's just astonishing to me that that was enough. But I guess the, the code is, was shorter, so there was less to go wrong. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's not like it. Testing Grand Theft Auto, I suppose. No, <laughs> might take a bit longer. No, but even a, even a simple game requires quite a lot of time to, to kick out all of the uh, all of the problems. So yeah, that's um, quite impressive to me. And the tuning up is going on at the same time uh, because they, they, you know that our games are difficult to play. I mean, and we weren't unique. We were just in line with everyone else. Everything's difficult from that era. Is difficult, um, and we were tuning up. To find that, I used to think of it as sort of a, a narrow line through the game where it wasn't easy, so that people would do it easily, and it wasn't so difficult that it was impossible. We were just finding that point where there was maximum enjoyment. Yeah, psychologists now talk about the flow channel, which is exactly what you're describing here. A guy called Chicks and Mahai, that's theory flow, which is exactly what you just described there. So you actually beat him to the punch there, and you just didn't come up with a fancy name for it and stick a book out. You missed a trick there. <laughs> See, another mistake. There are so many, you can't imagine the number of mistakes. To be honest, also, there's a thing about that. 
when you sat and worked, I don't know what you guys are like, but because we put out a lot of games over, over a period, so really when you've worked and you've seen the work that's gone into finding that line uh, where, where it's difficult enough but not too difficult, where people are getting the maximum reward for it. Because a, a, a crucial thing about a video game, an absolutely crucial thing is that there is no reason for buying this thing or having this thing or using this thing except the experience of using it. Um, and I compare it with a loaf of bread. You know, a loaf of bread can be very tasty, can't it? But actually, if you're hungry, it doesn't matter so much if it's not very tasty. Because you've got a reason for wanting a piece of piece. I want some bread because I'm hungry. It's not merely for the, the enjoyment of the bread is not necessarily central to the experience. But with a video game, there is nothing else. There is just the enjoyment as you go through. Uh, and so getting that line, you, you could, you've called it something, getting that so, line, <laughs> the flow line through the, the thing, is crucial, and you've got to get there before release, certainly in our, in our time, and I'd say it's still true now. Um, you've got to find that line. And of course, when you've done it a few times, you, start, you begin to realise the other half of it is that when you're playing the game, you think, ah, oh, these guys are just messing with my mind, aren't they? They've just, they've just made this just that, oh, why don't they make it easier so I didn't have to work so hard? And so in a way, for me, it's one of the reasons I'm not much of a, a, a video gamer. I just feel that sense of somebody on the other end, somebody on the other side of this thing, just poking at me, just making it <laughs> just too difficult for you, isn't it? Just a bit, you know, that, that sort of thing. So, uh, yeah, sure. But to answer your question, it was for us a three-month process from, from uh, through the PR, the artwork development, writing the, um, whatever the supporting stories are, tuning it up, uh, QA, QA. And uh, in the early days, of course, the games which arrived with us from the good people were all pretty well nailed. I mean, Mike Mayo, who did uh, Night Fight, he threw Age of Traffic Control, Steve Turner, Andrew Braybrook, uh, Ralph Chaffee, you, you know you all. This is John Phillips. The stuff they delivered had been properly playtested. So we weren't actually doing a great deal of... Yeah, but maybe that is the secret, that a lot of the kicking of the tyres had happened before it even arrived at the desk. And, 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 and we had to develop the internal capability. It, it, once we started doing things in real volume with people, we had to develop, and certainly it would be true by the time we were doing pinball, we were playing that game. For, that's why Barry Simpson was so good at it. You know, he played it, 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 played it. Played it, played it, played it, played it, played it, and then he'd written a report about it, which went back to Sweden uh, to say it's going wrong here, it's going wrong there, you know, all, all the rest of it. How long have we got before they kick us out of the room? Have we got time? Uh, we've got more questions than other questions. If anyone's got any questions, thank you. Um, I have one question. I have a um, um, C64 DTV, and it's basically a great hits of uh, uh, C64 games by uh, Houston. And can you share anything about it, how the games of Houston came onto the D64? Is that the C64 Mini, did you say? No, no, no. no. this is the older system, uh, made by oh. Jerry Ellsworth. Uh, well, I mean, the first game we did for the C64, we talked about it already, it was uh, Grippy's Day Out. Uh, so, um, until then, we'd, all, we'd done all Spectrum and Dragon 32. Um, and maybe we'd done a, a, a couple of things on the BBC as well. So, um, the, I'm not sure what you want me to say, except we started... Uh, 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 well, well the, this is a device that came about, I think, in 2000, 2001, something like that. And it collects old Tucson games? Yes. Oh, the, the, the joystick. The joystick. The joystick. Yes. The joystick. Yes. The joystick. Yes. Well, that would have been licensed by uh, the, the, king, the King's Games, I think. Yeah, the Rebellion would have licensed that. So, I, don't own, I don't own the rights. We don't own the rights to that anymore. So, it was... Um, how does that joystick work? Come it's, a, it's a joystick that you plug into your TV and it's preloaded with a bunch of games. And yeah. I think uh, so Re Rebellion, who own the rights and use of games now, would have licensed them. How, how, onto did the that how did the Kingsley's end up with the Houston rights? Bought them and we put them. Just a big catch off there. 
Yeah. 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 Ye
<laughs> what, what, what do you want me to say? You know, the, the, um, uh, that's, uh, that was the zeitgeist, that's what people did. Uh, and um, it was uh, um, the early days, before the internet became established, but the early days when people started buzzing things around electronically. It was a bit open season on the games, definitely. It wasn't good news, it wasn't good news for us. It wasn't good news for the business. Uh, it, it was really very undermined because things would get cranked and uploaded uh, and available re really overnight, literally overnight. Yeah, I mean, there was, there was a lot of games available on the BBSs that were that weren't even in the shops. And you know, you'd be calling these, not me personally, but you'd be calling these Australian bulletin boards in the middle of the night, and your parents would get a massive hefty bill. <laughs> Unless you knew how to the blue box and things yeah. like that. Um, but yeah, I was, I was finding it ironic that they expected people to buy the games, but then of course, a lot of crackers and the people that were involved in the scene went on to be very good musicians. No, sure. The games like Format, the Mikey, you know, went on to work for Core and lots, you know, lots of other people. I think that some good things did come from that, yeah, I'll, I'll, from that as well as obviously the, the, the oh, side yeah. of the Pirates. Thank you for Yeah, yeah and, and, and really, yeah. um, it's an interesting thing about piracy is that you try to ignore it uh, when you're in business you're, uh, trying to make a living, which is basically what we're trying to do. Then you do tend to close your eyes to problems that you don't feel that you can solve. Um, and it didn't. It ha obviously, it was true of the uh, video games industry, but I think it would be true of, of the music industry, wouldn't it? You know, there's Napster. Running for years, openly stealing copyright material, openly stealing, not even worrying about that, uh, it, and then um, and then event, only eventually getting closed down. But take it being several years, and that's for a, for a, a music industry which has been going since uh, well, not shortly after the Second World War. That's a, you know, it's physical um, recording systems. Uh, you think you think they'd be on it? Immediately, but they clearly felt they couldn't do anything about it. I'm afraid we've run out of time. I'm afraid that's it. So, everyone, say thank you very much to Andrew and Chris 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 Chris